guys, Jay here. Welcome to Models Memories Weekly, episode 74. Models Memories is a show about nothing and it is filmed in front of a live studio audience. This is a show where I talk about my painting, modeling, and wargaming experiences from the week. Now you might be thinking to yourself, Jay, you put out three activities a week and you stream every single night. You know what? No how. I'm not saying how this week. You guys don't get a how. How do you like that? And how do I have more to say? Well, I do. And here it goes. This week here at Ye Olde Eons of Battle Incorporated, we hit a little bit of a milestone. Look at this. Look, you can probably see yourself because it's a little reflective. We have the 100,000 subscriber plaque and it's really cool and it's really exciting. And uh, thank you guys for helping us get here. Feel free to unsubscribe now. They sent it, it's here, so we're good. <laughs> Please don't unsubscribe. But yeah, it's shiny and it's kind of nice. And they sent us a little uh, a little printed uh, document that says, hello, insert name of channel here. We, <laughs> we are so proud to have you on our platform and we watch all of your videos and love you lots. That's pretty much exactly what it said. <laughs> then a, a grainy digital signature It's lovely. It's very lovely. The presentation is great. Came in a box that said YouTube that was super banged up from shipping. So cool, but yeah, we have the plaque. Vindication! That's uh, something we're doing here is working, so. Anyway, <laughs> I wanna look at some new stuff, cause holy moly, Games Workshop showed off a whole bunch of new stuff. One thing I really wanna talk about, which was kind of out of left field was, they showed off light rules, free light rules for Kill Team, which is awesome. It shows that they're trying, which is great because Kill Team 2018, they did not try. Number one, the Kill Team rules were just Warhammer 40K 8th edition. Like no change. Literally the stat lines were all copy and pasted, which meant that some things worked okay and some things really didn't work. When Games Workshop tried to do expansions for Kill Team 2018, there was, they just, they made, they made nothing. There was like, hey, here's five gene stealers and three inches of pipe. Is that, is that something? Does that work for the game? It didn't. Also, they only sold them for like four weeks and then they were discontinued forever. And so people couldn't use them. And then tournaments were saying like, well, you can't use the one rule that it came with because people can't actually buy it. And so we're not going to use those rules. And then arena, which some people kind of like, but it, kind of made Kill Team not feel like a actual war game because you didn't use like physical terrain. And then they made Pariah Nexus, which is, oh my goodness, that was the worst thing ever. Literally Pariah Nexus was just, we haven't made a big box in a while, shove some things in a box and call it Kill Team. Whereas now they're trying really hard and it's really working out. The free rules, it pretty much covers everything. It doesn't have the secondary objectives and it doesn't have, um, the unique terrain rules that nobody uses anyway that have come in all of the expansion boxes. Like the normal terrain rules are fine. They play fine. And then the Octaris expansion rules are not bad because it was a scramble over. So you, you'd say that this piece of terrain has the scramble and so you can move next to it and then you can move to the other side of it. Works really, really well. It's a really good mechanic because it can help you get you out of a jam. Like if you have a bunch of guys piled up you can't, you're not allowed to move through other models, so you can just scramble over that terrain piece to get away from it. it. Works really well. Really, they should just make that a normal mechanic as opposed to having it be like an Octara specific rule. The other ones for like Chalnath and Nackment aren't as good. They're a little bit more situational. There's like Vantage Point Plus that I've never heard anybody ever mention because Vantage Point is fine. It doesn't need, it doesn't need any additional rules. But they, that's just kind of what they do. They come out with one new unique terrain rule per box. But yeah, it's really cool that they came out with light rules. The light rules read really well. Arguably the light rules read better than the normal rules from the book because the light rules actually use a lot of negatives and the normal rule book really only uses positives. You can do this if that. You can, you know, you can perform a move action. You can only perform one move action or one action of each type per phase. And that leads to a lot of confusion because when you're playing a game, you have a lot of negative questions. Well, am I allowed to do this? Is this something I can or cannot do? And then if you have to read two positive rules, you know, yes, you can make a move rule, 
or you can make a move, but no, you cannot do the same action twice per phase. And so you can't do two moves, even though it might read like you can do two moves. Whereas the light rules underneath every normal rule, it just says you cannot do this because you cannot do this when that, and that's perfect. It helps clarify things. I don't know. Um, I took, I took a, a college class in logic and I dropped out after three weeks because <laughs> I could not wrap my brain around it whatsoever. And maybe everybody else can, um, but it's just, it's so, so confusing to break language down into math and then formulate these like rules that it's just so difficult. And so a lot of the times, and I've, I've read a lot of wargaming rules for a lot of different games, and they always sort of have a little bit of this in there. Whereas what I wish that they would do is that, you know, when you're writing a rule book, you write your rule book and then you hand it to like your mom and some guy at the bus station and just people who have no earthly idea and let them read it and try to figure it out. Because when I'm reading the rules, I always come up with questions and then I have to read it again and again and again to figure out the answers. And then after I played a couple of games, I have to read the rules again and again and again to like really understand it. But I feel like if you if you really gave it to randos who have no idea what this is or how they're meant to read it. Oh, you know what? Maybe we should, you know, right off the bat, say that if your model is in a conceal order that you can do this and that, but not that, as opposed to saying this is a conceal order and then as you read on further, you find out X, Y, and Z. Um, I think I think that's, you know, rules are hard and they're going to be complicated and confusing. There's no magical way to make it all make perfect sense. Maybe a video. Although I watched a lot of videos and it's still always confusing because really having somebody, uh, like demonstrations are probably the best, but it's hard to find the person who is explaining it perfectly for you because I've watched a lot of videos and some of them I'm like, I got it. You said exactly the things that I needed to hear to understand it. And then I watched other videos where I'm like, I, you, I'm lost. I don't understand what you're talking about. So yeah, I like, I like simplified rules and I like free rules. That's, that's very nice. Good old kill team. And in the kill team article, it said they're going to be doing the same thing for Warcry, which is great because I think Warcry looks super cool and I have tons of models that I could use to play Warcry with. And so it'd be really fun to, uh, to get those free rules and then just try it out, see what happens. I mean, I, you know, I would argue that games should just make all rules and all data sheets free because it's craziness that they're still doing books. There's a tiny baby bit of hope because with 30K, they made some of the rules free and then um, they did compendiums. And compendiums are at least a little better because instead of having to buy one Space Marine Codex and then one Black, Tar Black Templar Space Marine uh extra rule booklet that's somehow still really expensive. You just get Space Marine Compendium and then you have the rules for Black Templar and rules for tons of the other armies that you might end up facing down the line. <sighs> good old, good old Games Workshop and selling books. I get it. They're, they're stuck because it's a, it's a revenue source for them. And it's, it's, some, it's quite something to chop that off, but oh my goodness, it'd be so much better. And I think compendiums are a good middle ground between apps and physical rules because people like physical rules. One of the things that people really like about Wargaming is it's not an app. It's not a video game. And so I totally get it when people are like, when people are saying like, I'll just look it up on the app. And it's like, I don't want to get my phone out. That sucks. My phone sucks. And so maybe the compendium is the middle ground. Early eighth edition compendium Warhammer 40K was a beautiful, beautiful time to be in 40K. I mean, now is also an awesome time, but just Every rule in the entire game boiled down into four books. That was nice. No extra season pass. No, oh, it's been another, you know, two quarters. We need to come out with a book that has a couple of new rules in it and a couple of fixed rules and changes books. They are pretty though. I would love it if maybe there was the compendium and then separate art and lore books. I would go so hard on art and lore books it would be it would be bad for me financially. Like if I could buy the Space Marine, I mean, they already used Omnibus for their Black Library novels, which is too bad because it's a great name. Like the Space Marine, com, now they already also use the word compendium. The Space Marine 
bundle and just have tons of, of maybe chapters from Black Library novels, all the lore that's ever been in any of the codexes, all of the artwork ever made, that would be really, really sweet. And a lot of people don't care. So they wouldn't buy the books, but then a lot of people care a lot. And so then we would buy that book along with the compendium. And it would actually feel like we're buying something because most people who buy the codexes don't care about anything except for those rules. And so they can buy the compendium and then us weirdos can buy the beautiful art books. Yeah, good old, good old getting rules for free. Oh, they also came out with uh, unique, basically white dwarf rules for space marines so that you can take a combination of intercessors and assault intercessors, which is really cool. I'll definitely be running that because I have a team of five assault intercessors and five just regular space marines. And so uh, now you can take six of them and kill team. And I don't have a six, six guys painted up ready. So now I can just combine them and run them like that because I really do like running the Space Marines. They are really fun to play. But in addition to how awesome Kill Team is, they came out with a whole bunch of new models. And I suppose let's look at the Warhammer Plus Year 2 miniatures. So Warhammer Plus basically is everyone's favorite thing. I don't think I've ever heard a single negative thing about Warhammer Plus ever. I think everybody is super in love with the, with this subscription service where you know you pay a little bit of money and then you get a tiny bit of stuff but the 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 last year's miniatures were fine the vindicar assassin was really cool and there was an orc this year it's uh, it looks like it's going to be chaos models and these both these models are really really cool and they're doing something very smart which they should have done last year but they didn't if you subscribe for the year you just get the model. You get the model a month later when it's ready to go, you get it. That's how it should be. It should be you're buying a cool model, a limited edition model, and you also get access to Warhammer TV with it, as opposed to you're subscribing to Warhammer TV, oh, and you also get a model. If you don't subscribe uh, for, if you don't subscribe for the whole year, but you pay monthly for the whole year, you're gonna get your mini at the end of that 12 month period. And the models are, Azrak, the Annihilator, World Eater's Terminator. This is a great use of the Warhammer Plus miniature, in my opinion. It's a model that is, I mean, it's they took a piece of artwork and then turned it into reality, and it doesn't really look like a Warhammer model. It looks a lot more like a sculpture that somebody made of something from Warhammer. It's kind of like the Primarchs, how they're not quite in the standard style of a Games Workshop miniature. This model looks phenomenal and like art weirdos are gonna super want this model to paint it. But I could, I wouldn't, I, I think if this was just sold, I feel like it almost wouldn't do well because it doesn't fit into the design aesthetic that exists in current 40K and for current 40K um, Chaos Space Marines. It just looks different. It looks very different from the current Chaos Terminators. It looks kind of different from everything. I mean, some people would just because weird and chaos is weird and wacky, but I think that, that making a unique model that they couldn't really get away with otherwise is awesome. The other one is something that they could have gotten away with, but it's a it's it's the Warhammer Plus model. Mibilor Darkfang Chaos Sorceress. Uh, this model is great. It's, it comes with Chaos Familiars, which we haven't seen for a while. That The Chaos Familiars got discontinued a while ago, but it's really fun to see them back. And the Sorceress looks great. It's, see like what makes the Chaos Sorcerer so great, or not the Chaos, this is the Chaos Sorcerer. What makes the Chaos Space Marine uh, in Terminator armor so great is that it's an artsy fartsy model that maybe not everybody would want, but you can get it. You have access to it from the Warhammer Plus. This is just a normal, cool 40, like Age of Sigmar style model that people would want, but is kind of locked behind the paywall of Warhammer TV. Not as great. I would have loved two artsy fartsy models, but I can't argue with it. The model looks really, really cool. I like the, I like her little staff. I love all of the familiars. I like little knight. I, the little knight with the little sword on his shoulder. I love it. And she's stepping on a, on a book. With, there's a sword stabbed into a book and she's stepping on it. I wonder, I hope that she doesn't accidentally stab straight through like a really important spell in her spell tome because that could 
Wouldn't it be really embarrassing if she's in the middle of a battlefield and she flips open the book and then she's about to cast her spell and she's destroyed the incantation because uh, she's bad at doing her homework and she doesn't have her spells memorized? That would be that would be bad news bears. But yeah, both these models are excellent. Uh, I think there's sort of a... Uh, it's hard to say it's a clear winner because not everybody is going to be into that Terminator because he's weird and wacky. But I think these are excellent miniatures. Another year of Warhammer TV. I have a, a theory about Warhammer TV because it is a weird thing. Clearly, Games Workshop doesn't have the ability or the money to really push it into like being a, a real thing. They don't have a real production studio. They don't have, you know, real people behind these projects. They do sort of in a, in a way. Like I would say they these are good programs for YouTube. Like, you know, they're good quality. But like for an actual streaming platform, they're not that good. But I wonder if they're using Warhammer Plus to make money to pay for artists and people to do these things in the hopes that it snowballs into something really good that they could like sell to Netflix or, well, probably not Netflix anymore, but sell to Disney Plus or some streaming service, Quibi. <laughs> it's definitely gonna sell to Quibi. Um, yeah, because as it is, it's a weird little thing. And I'm sure, I'm sure the tiny amount of money that they put behind it is like nothing. And what they have to show for it is nothing that Disney Plus would ever take, even reply to that email. So that's my conspiracy theory is that Warhammer Plus is them attempting to make real movies and TV shows in the hopes that one day it'll snowball into actual movies and TV shows, which is probably not a bad idea. But speaking of things that are not a bad idea, let's look at squats. We have been drip fed squats over the course of months and months, and they're drip feeding us some more. Yeah, they're showing off all three trikes. They showed off trikes like first thing for squats, and I thought they looked great. And seeing the whole squad together, I think they all look excellent. They have, they the way that they've gotten them to float is one of the trikes hover emitters is touching a rock. And that's not a bad way to do it, but I would love to have them maybe up on a little bit of a flying stand to make them really look like they're floaty and bouncy. I wonder how smooth a ride these things are. Like, are we talking like Star Wars hover where it's like perfectly level? Because I think that these are, they're bouncing around like they always provide a cushion of air, but the air is, you know, touches or the air hits the ground and then repels off of it. And so I like to think that these things are bouncing around, which makes it even funnier when they're covered in guns because they're just trying to get a good shot and they just can't, can't hold it steady. Yeah, I like these models a lot. They remind me a lot of um, Fallout's art style, where it's kind of like punk 50s. And uh, I think that these models look excellent. But that's something that Games Workshop has sort of shown off before. They showed off a brand new unit. Finally, some HQs for the squats. Lead your kin host from the front with the skill, determination, and giant fist of a League of Votan call. Uh, yeah, it's a leader. I would say A++ for Tactical Rock. That is quite a Tactical Rock, and I really like it. I want to defend Tactical Rocks here for a little bit, because uh, Tactical Rocks, some people meme on the Tactical Rocks from a place of love, because they look, they look good, and it makes sense for your leader to be a little special. And then some people argue that Tactical Rocks are annoying, because why is it always a rock? And I would argue because the point of Warhammer is to do whatever you want to build a band of warriors that are your own. And part of building a band of warriors that are your own is like using creativity and your own ideas to make them your own. And so having them up on a rock really means, yeah, you can have them up on a rock. Maybe you turn that rock into a tree. Maybe you turn that rock into a pile of dead enemies. Like it gives you so many options for creativity, whereas just having your model flat, like yes, you can also have him standing flat on stuff, but then you you don't, like you'll just have him glued flat to the base, or he'll be standing on a perfectly flat pile of dead bodies. 
I think I think that the tactical rocks are a good way to like be creative and do something interesting. And I think it's it comes from a weird place of like people want options and they want to, they want to be super creative, but in the, exactly the creative way that Games Workshop tells them to be. <laughs> so I don't know. I think tactical rocks are fine. I like tactical rocks. I like my leaders to be standing a little bit taller than the other ones because it makes the models much more self-evident and I feel like it makes them better gaming pieces where your enemy, your opponent just knows that guy is important because he's a little taller and he's standing on a thing. And all of the other guys who are just standing on flat ground are less important. So I really like the tactical rocks. But let's talk about the model. I think uh, I like everything about this model except his huge dong. It's, it's really, I mean, this, I mean, maybe this is just saying a lot about me, but instantly saw these image, boom, right to the dong because it's so sculpted. Like if you look at the, the artwork that they showed off, which is gorgeous and it shows this character, it's a very subtle dong, a gentlemanly bulge, but if you look at the miniature, like there is there is an edge highlight and like a secondary reflection on the dong piece. It's crazy. And you could minimize it a little bit with painting, but I almost feel like just make that a lot smaller or just omit that piece of armor. It looks like a cup. Like <laughs> it's just so weird. Like if you omit that piece from the design and just have his pants lead up to his belt, I feel like it would look, it would look better. It would look m more natural. It would look more correct than having a big old dong. <laughs> uh, yeah. I love everything else about the model. I think it's really, really good. Uh, I like his armor. I like his pose. I like his cape. I, I actually sort of like the little Norse dragon head on that's kind of hanging over his head. They've done that on a bunch of different Leagues of Otan models and it always kind of looked out of place or tacked on, but on this guy, it looks right, especially since this guy has a lot more of that heraldry. But in him, it's kind of done in ways that make sense. A lot of the other Leagues of Otan, it was just like, oh look, there's like some extra space on his pec armor, so let's just put a symbol there and they just added that right into the armor. Whereas on him, it's like his belt buckle is a symbol. His, um, the tassels of his robes are a symbol. Uh, his head is a symbol. It's a very finely crafted, like golden helmet. And his shoulder pads are obviously the natural place for symbols to be. And so I think it really, it really works out on him where it sort of doesn't, or it looks out of place on the other leagues of Otan. So yeah, I really like it. I really like uh, his power fist has these like energy nodules coming out of it. It reminds me a lot of in Hellboy, uh, the villain Rasputin. He had the, he had the the energy gauntlet that he used to like open a portal to hell and bring Hellboy in from the other realm. And he had the coolest glove with LEDs and lights that were spinning. And so I'm getting a little bit of that vibes on his power fist, which is really, really neat. But yeah, overall, I think this model is great. The The rock he's standing on, it's either been shot up and that's why it's covered in craters or maybe it's a little bit of moon rock. That could be a really, really cool thing. Like these guys are, are miners and they're, they're known for like harvesting a lot of stuff off of asteroids. And so I could see like moon basing or some sort of like kind of barren, desolate alien planet basing would be really, really neat for these guys. All of the head options look really cool. All the weapon options are really cool. The dong is just staring right at me. It's... <laughs> uh, it's just so front and center. It's wild. It's a little bit the same on the Space Marine Gravis armor, but at least the Space Marine Gravis armor, it looks more like he has like a belly as opposed to, you know, he's got his belt buckle and then a gigantic round cod piece with two big rivets in it. It's it's a little it's a little interesting that design choice. I wonder how hard that I bet that wouldn't be that hard to modify to make it just a little just a little subtler. That's all I want. Just a little a little subtler on the dong. Yeah, I think this model is great. 
He does have a little bit of a wide stance, which is good, which is fine. I like this pose, but I would love another pose with like less of a wide stance, which you know, they'll probably do because most armies have like a captain, which is, you know, your big leader and then a lieutenant who's like your little leader. And so, I mean, maybe this is the little leader and we still haven't seen the big old leader. But yeah, I like, I like this model a lot. And actually the leagues of Otan were not the only thing to get floaty jet bikey things. Take a spin on the Escher Cutter, a lightning fast jet bike for when the floor really is lava. Oh, that's so cute. I love that. These are really cool looking. Necromunda has phenomenal models and I could see these working really, really well Maybe even not in Necromunda, but just in like general sci-fi, just general sci-fi speeders. They look kind of Star Wars-y. Like I could totally see these in the background of a Star Wars movie. They look fast. They look mean. They look like the pod racers from the best Star Wars episode one, The Phantom Menace. They look like just the engines. Actually in The Mandalorian, one of the characters, Cobb, he had a speeder bike made out of a pod racer. And it's kind of, it's along the same lines as these. I love that just the big guns bolted to the side. I like, I like all the, the ladies piloting these things like um, motorcycles. I think these are excellent. They're really cool. They give me a lot of ideas. I could, like they just came out with a bunch of speeder bikes, swoop bikes for Star Wars Legion. I could see swapping a couple of these in because they look right. They look like sci-fi, you know, cobbled together, greebled jet bikes. They look really good. I also love that they're on the oval cavalry bases instead of regular flying stands because regular flying stands suck. I actually did this on all of my Necron um, tomb blades. Yeah, my Necron tomb blades, they were on the normal 32 millimeter clear flying stand and they're so big and so annoying they would all fall down and they all broke. And so I fixed them all up and then I put them on the oval cavalry bases, which I think is fine because the models overhung those 32 millimeter bases so bad that they would bump into stuff and when they fell, they would land on the model. And it just, it was terrible, but the oval bases basically perfectly, is like a perfect silhouette for the shadow of that model. And so it just gives it a lot more surface area to grab onto with the table. And so it's less likely to knock over. It basically can't tip forward anymore because of that length. So yeah, really, really good idea to have these flying stands attached to the oval cavalry bases. I like that a lot. It's gonna make these much, much more fun to play with in game than the normal awful clear plexiglass. The only, the only way they ever fixed those, fixed those was giving you like the big honking 60 millimeter clear flying stem. And that was horrible because flying stands, in theory, flying stands are clear. And so, yo, it's clear, it's hard to see. It's, you know, you just sort of ignore it. But in reality, they're super glossy, shiny, clear acrylic that draws the eye because it looks like a Lego lightsaber. I don't like them at all. It'd be much, I would argue it's much more like subtle and easy to ignore if it was just painted a gray or a black. But yeah, these models I really, really like. Everything for everything for Necromunda is really cool and I like it a lot. I haven't really taken a close look at how the Ash Wastelands work, but it's interesting that all the factions seem to be getting vehicles and the board that they showed off in that $300 Ash Wasteland box, it wasn't a very big board. So I wonder how do these vehicles Cause like a normal guy, I guess he could get across the board in what, three turns? And so are these vehicles, like you can get across the board in one turn? I would, I don't know exactly how these work out in game, but I really like them. Ah, oh, these would be great for Gene Stealer Cult. If you use these instead of the normal Ridge Runners, the normal, um, uh, just motorcycles. Um, they are probably pretty small. It would probably be tough to have a Space Marine on there. Sisters of Battle would look really, really good on these. Maybe even some Imperial Guard Rough Riders. You take one of those hands and you give them a giant lance tipped with frag grenades. Yeah, these are really, really cool models and I see tons and tons of possibilities. 
And the guns are just bolted to the side, so you can swap those out with anything or just leave them off. Oh, I just had a thought. What if you have your Adeptus Custodes and your super cool Dawn Eagle jet bikes, and then next to them, you have your little sisters of silence swooping in on these little bikes. And so you've got the 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 papa bear bikes and the and the baby bear bikes right next to each other. Ah, uh, I almost want to make that happen. I haven't bought anything for Necromunda. Uh, I bought the original box that came out in what, 2017, 2018, but I haven't bought anything else for Necromunda. I might I might buy these. These are really cool. But you know what else is really cool? That's right, our Patreon. Over there, we have a Miniature of the Month Club. This month, we have a demon, complete with ball gag, a bound demon. We also have some really, really cool terrain to let you build a modular trenches across your battlefield. You also get access to one extra episode of Eons of Battle a week where we take a look at your miniatures and we give you feedback and critique. And then we also have a, on Fridays, we all hop into a Discord server together and we just chit chat the night away. We also have merch, link in the description. Ah, some really, really cool models. The Escher Jet Bikes have really, uh, really tempted me and some new squat models that I actually kind of like. Yeah, good job.